Welcome to the Parker Office Hours. It is August 13th, uh, 2024. We are alive and happy. We have a lot of new releases and uh, features to talk about, which is super exciting because the last couple of months kind of actually were quite quiet. Um, and we've been cooking. So uh, we have new Parker. Uh, a new Parker release. We have a big new Parker agent release, and we're going to dive into into all of that right now. Um, and we can start with the first one right away, which is the easy query mode. I'm going to share a local instance of Parker that is running on my machine. So the data might sometimes look a bit funky because it's a desktop machine, not actually a server. So just just to keep that in mind. But yeah, first. First things first, uh, Yomi, you want to take it away? Yes. Um, so like Matthias said, we have shipped a uh, lot of stuff over the past few weeks, uh, months even. Um, and one of the first things is the simple query mode, um, which is now on 0 0.22. Uh, so you can check it out. But the idea here is that we Previously had only the freeform method. So if yeah, if you go to the advanced mode, yeah. We had the freeform method where you could like, you know, type in um, stuff, you can, you know, do some rejects um, and you know, just basically use your keyboard to like type in stuff and do some querying. But then we also had feedback that um, some people might prefer a a mode where it was easier to like easily select stuff around instead of just typing. Um so Basically, that's what this is about. Um, you know, you get to type in your label names, type in your label values. You can add as much as you want, um, as much as you want, and that's the idea behind the simple query mode um, right now. And of course, like if you select anything in the simple query mode right now, it also like automatically reflects in the in the advanced mode too. So that's that's pretty nifty. Um, and of course, like you know. Everything here is, as usual, is persisted in the URL. So if you're sharing your um, your, your link with someone, it still persists in the URL. So that's that's not about the, the simple query mode. Uh, next on the queue is the some by labels, which um, is already in, in effect here. So if Matthias, if you just close that and do a search again. Oh, okay, it's because it's like yeah, because it's your desktop. But um, ideally, the use case for the some by labels is when you have like a lot of processes and it's not necessarily like useful for you, and there's like lots of stuff on the metrics graph. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, like this. Yeah, exactly. There's like lots of lines that like you want to like easily understand what you're seeing. And um, basically, the some by feature helps you to aggregate all of your metrics. So in this case, we have like two labels here, com and node. If you would like to see at a glance all the processes that uses the com labels, the sum by feature is um, what you need. And basically, like it, like the name describes, it just sums all of the labels together and outputs a very much simpler metrics um, graph to to read and and, and understand. Um, so so that's that's about the sum by feature. Um, I think there's a, one one more one more thing here. If Matthias yeah. now hovers over the graph, you mm -hmm. can see that now there's only the com label yeah. because that's the one that we aggregated by. Yeah. Um, so if you now, for example, switch this around, Matthias, and made it the node label. Yeah. Let me actually just filter down to a very specific process. So now we can see both, right? Yeah. And no, no. Uh, yeah. Exactly. And if you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly this. And now you only see the node node yeah. label. So if we have many, many nodes or many processes, it's squished down to those yeah. um, dimensions. And we can do multiple ones. So now yes. yeah. if we if we had like 20 label names, we could group by just these two and we would only see these two are reflected in the tooltip and also as in like the sum time series, but I mean, it's kind of like we only have these two <laughs> for this demo, it seems like. We can see here as well, we only have these two. So it's not as effective right now, but still works. 
I guess I guess I can do by node, right? And then like everything gets aggregated, and now I see everything, um, like the total amount of CPUs. Whereas previously it was like kind of like grouped by the com, so the process name. No. Yeah, pretty sweet. Yeah, sweet, sweet, sweet. Um, and then the last thing from my side is the new combined um, range picker, which uh, also due to feedback, we sort of like went back to what we had before, where um, just like clicking on the this picker allows you to easily switch between the relative and the absolutes like quite easily. So it's sweet in a way that you get to like, you know, choose any of the pre predefined um, time selection here, but at the same time with a tab switch, you can easily switch to the absolute, uh, the absolute value. And, you know, the, the relative still works as before. You can um, just type in a value and it still works as it is. And obviously switching between both modes still reflects the, the, the range. So yeah, that's, that's it from my side. So this is super easy now. So I yeah. want 15 minutes and six seconds because that's what I usually want. Ah, actually, there's a bucket seems. Yeah, <laughs> I can't press enter. That should work. Yeah, we'll, we'll fix it until yeah. you get to try it. But yeah, cool. Yeah, I'm. I'm just yeah happy that like. It's kind of like the best combination of everything we had in the old and new time picker. And this kind of like a morphed version of one and three, uh, one and two, making it version three of the time picker we have. So, yeah, super nice. Um, I guess I'm up next. I need to actually move around my windows so I can see what I'm going to talk about. Uh, yeah, so relative comparisons. So that's pretty cool as well. Um, let me actually go here and say why come. Um, and maybe just because I, I've seen it, there's like Hyperland, there's like uh, Wayland, um, what's it called? Um, window Compositor, uh, Tiling Window Manager. And what we now can do is uh, go into the compare mode. And previously, uh, what always worked was kind of like taking this and, and this profile, so kind of like taking a base and a compare profile. And now we can see how uh, diffs, so like um, the, the actually uh, green stuff kind of gotten better uh, compared to before, and the red one has gotten worse in terms of using more CPU or less CPU. Um, if, if we're looking at CPU profiles, and then um, blue is kind of like it's the same. Uh, but what we had before is um, these these absolute comparisons, right? Um, and, and what that man, means is that we could basically, like on the left-hand side, for example, we always had to make sure that we have like five minutes, and on the right-hand side, we had to make sure that we select five minutes for the actual um, profiles to be relative uh, the even to to compare like apples and apples and not apple and oranges where like the, the underlying data is vastly different. Um, so what we have now uh, in in Parker is the um, relative comparisons and th those are enabled by default if you use like uh, on CPU or um, a CPU um, seconds total etc. Uh, um, profiles and what it does is. Um, regardless of what you have uh, on on each side, you can you can use like the last hour and just the last like five minutes, uh, and you can compare it. And what it does is it it basically sums up all the profiles on on the one side and then sums up all the profiles on the on the other side, and then whatever profile is kind of like has the lower um, um, value, like the total cumulative value that has uh, uh, yeah fewer um, values in there um, gets kind of like scaled up to match um, the bigger profile, right? So um, it makes sure that even though here we look at one hour and here we only look at five minutes, those five minutes get scaled to whatever the, the value of the left-hand side here is with, with a lot more data in it. So now what we can see is the root is kind of blue. And that means that the 
kind of like starting point of comparing profiles is exactly the same. And now we basically only care about the relative percentage uh, that things have gotten better or worse. So now we can see that um, here we have gotten 7% uh, if you look at the diff uh, column in, uh, in the tooltip, 7% worse. Whereas here um, it's like 40% uh, better on this side. And we can see a bit better how things actually compare over time if we look at like different time ranges. Um, and additionally, what's also really cool is that there are some people who run um, setups where they have um, like 100 hertz frequency um, for um, development environments and only 10 hertz frequency of profiling a frequency for their production environments. And using the new relative comparisons, we can also scale it up um, to basically get like the 10 hertz um, profiles to 100 hertz, basically, and then comparing Apple and Apple again, where now we can we can compare these like completely different environments and make make sense of of the actual data, at least in in relation to each other. So that's pretty exciting. Um, it's been it's been super helpful um, comparing. Uh, rollout, for example, I'm just like saying, okay, this version compared to this version and this old version obviously ran like six hours and compared to just the last 15 minutes of the new version being deployed, right? Uh, and that all of a sudden actually makes sense now. And we can't just use two points or need to make sure that it's like actually five minutes on each side, something like that. So we have a, a blog post for it on, on Polar Signals as well, uh, going a bit more into detail uh, if you're interested. I think a lot of things we're talking about have blog posts actually. Um, yeah, and then the other cool thing is in the table uh, view, which we now have, or which we always had, right? Um, we now have it a bit more interactive where we can say, um, for example, we, we want to see where um, that's just, filter by by the flat value and now we, we see okay this this is taking like the most uh, time in our uh, program and now I can click on it and I can see everything that is calling that specific function so here we see the function itself and above we see the uh, callers and below we see the callees um, so we can we can basically see that for example um, this one is I don't know it's recursively calling itself it's looking like um and it actually comes it, it gets a lot of uh, calls from from this function for example so my radeon driver calls this function to do some stuff and we can we can kind of like similar to how we how we can go deeper down into flame graph and make sense of of things we can now go go up by clicking on the in the on, on the callies uh, or go down clicking on the on the callers not the other way around but you get the idea um, so we can kind of traverse this table a bit more interactively, which is which is super fun and super useful as well. So yeah, like this one, right? Like malloc. Where 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 do all the calls come from that call malloc, for example? So uh, we can see we can see this one here, for example, um, doing a lot of malloc operations. So it kind of like shifts things around a bit, uh, makes it just more explorable in a different way. Um, yeah, and I think I think that's it. Um, heading over to Frederick. Yeah, um, I'll add one more thing. Uh, the, the thing that's really cool about this um, caller collie view is um, the thing that you can see in a flame graph is when lots of different code paths end up calling the same things. And in cumulative, they make up a lot. And this is something that this view um, allows to do. So I think the malloc example here is, is yeah. super interesting, where let's say you can now do a merge across your entire infrastructure, and you can see where all the malloc calls are coming from across the entire infrastructure, right? And which ones go. are the malloc calls across the entire infrastructure that you should be optimizing? Right. Yeah, so there's one malloc call right here. Uh, it's I don't know. Can you see my cursor? Yeah, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So this one is like pretty hard to find, and there are probably a couple of others somewhere around uh, the leaf of the of the yeah. icicle graph. 
So this is what like makes it a lot easier that what Frederick was talking about to to find out where yeah, things are actually exactly. calling malloc from. Yeah. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Um I'm going to talk about a couple of things that let me, actually maybe let's start with inverting stacks because that's still a visual feature. Maybe we can close the comparison. I think the comparison yep. view is not super useful for this future feature, but uh, just kind of select any profile here. Uh, it doesn't really matter. The point is uh, we now allow kind of inverting the stack. This is a feature that has been requested a couple of times. Um, so this can, again, be interesting if you want to see everything that ends up being a leaf, like malloc, for example. Yeah, so uh, let's and actually, this is, a, <laughs> this is a great, um, yeah. So if you now hit invert uh, call stack, we can turn it around and we can find all the things that do some sort of allocations, right? Um, and we can find out all the code paths that have caused these allocations. Um, so again, kind of an interesting, um way to now kind of visualize this now this only works if the thing that you're looking for is the leaf right um and especially with me memory allocations this is often um often the case so um that's why this uh works works out quite well here um so yeah uh I that's the, last... the operator i knew again that we saw in yes. the collie you know, or caller table so it's pretty yeah, exciting yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's the last visual feature um, we have um, to talk about. Um, the next one is kind of a, this has been com coming for a very long time. Um, so for a long time, our symbolizer was, um, to put it bluntly, not, not very stable. Um, and it was basically uh, causing a bunch of like huge amounts of resources being necessary to run a Parka server. And this basically was due to the fact that Parker was constantly trying to symbolize every single memory, uh, every single program counter ever seen. But the thing is, most of the time, you're not going to be querying all data ever seen, right? So this is kind of unnecessary uh, to process, uh, to, to, to use so much processing power. And so we kind of turned it around and said, OK, we're only ever going to symbolize at read time. And whenever we do perform symbolization at read time, we do cache that. So we will never perform that again. So this kind of causes queries to be a little bit slower at first um, when using Parka. But it allows the Parka server to use enormously less uh, resources both CPU and memory, and only essentially spend it once when we're actually looking at the data. Um, so yeah, this has been a long time coming, and now there are a bunch of other symbolizer um, improvements that we can build on top of this, because we've been kind of working on this re-architecture for, for some time. Um, then uh, the last feature on the Parka server to talk about is um, there is an open telemetry uh, profiling working group that we're uh, participating in. And um, as part of this group, you know, that's quite literally what the open telemetry project is about. Um, we are working on standardizing um, a wire protocol for profiling data. Um, and uh, we basically have implemented the most up-to-date version of the experimental protocol that's currently specified. Um, now, there's a huge caveat here, which is last Thursday, it was decided to basically rework this entire protocol again. Um, so what we have today in the Parka server um, is what is, at this point, still the most up-to-date version of the experimental um, protocol but it's bound to change very dramatically um so that's a huge um asterisk to keep in mind here um, but we do plan to always keep up to date as much as possible with this um because as we as we know whenever these things do get specified a lot of people do request support for it um yeah that's that's pretty much it on the parka server actually there is kind of something that is on the on the same same lines 
um, and it's something that's that both went into Parka agent and Parka server, which is we've actually implemented also a new version of our own wire protocol that now directly uses Apache Arrow um, to both build um, you know the data that's going to be sent off to the server on the agent. Um, and then the server can completely ser serialization free insert this data into the database. So this whole process essentially is about reducing the amount of bytes that end up on the wire, uh, reducing the amount of CPU time that need that is used to both build and process the data. Um, and then ultimately, because there's it's completely serialization free, there's actually also some kind of memory pressure um, improvements here. So basically on all dimensions, uh, this again improves um, the interactions between Parka and Parka agent. That's pretty much it uh, from the um, Parka server. I don't know if um, Tommy or Brennan maybe want to talk about uh, the changes on the agent or um, if I, if you want me to continue on that. Um, you can continue if you want. Okay. Yeah, sure. you can say it. Go ahead. All right. Um, I'll let you take uh, the what's next uh, section then. Um, so uh, the big big announcement is um, basically um, there is a new project on uh, the Open Telemetry pro uh, project uh, that is also an eBPF based profiler. And long story short, there are lots of similarities uh, between the Parker agent and this project. Um, the project itself is intended to be much more bare bone, um, and there are a variety of companies essentially both contributing to this as well as consuming it as a library, exactly the same way as we are now with Parka Agent. So for Parka Agent users, this actually doesn't really mean very much. Um, it's basically all internal. Um, but uh, with this um, kind of merger of efforts, um, you know, we can all kind of pull on the same strings. And um, in addition to, you know, C, C++, Rust, Go, Ruby, and Python support that we previously already had, um, we now also gain JVM support, .NET support, Perl support, and PHP support. Um, so yeah, um, again, basically like for, for the PyCar agent binary, Basically, nothing changed. The same flags exist. The same manifests work. Um, it's basically a no op, but uh, folks got a huge amount of uh, language support added. Um, yeah. Um, in addition to that, um, one thing that kind of changed with this release of uh, Parka is the metadata that we're adding to profiling data. Previously, we kind of took all the metadata we could find um, about uh, this process, for example, and we attached that to the profiling data. Um, and that worked uh, really well, but we also found that for a lot of people, this was quite overwhelming because we're literally adding everything we could possibly find. So now we kind of turned this around and basically implemented the same thing as it is practiced in the Prometheus ecosystem um, and we've implemented relabeling. So basically, all this metadata that we previously added automatically are now meta labels um, that you can basically choose to add to the profiling data or not. And you can call the, the label names whatever you want. Um, you can pick and choose the labels that you're actually interested in um, so that you, you know, can get the metadata that actually is meaningful to you and your organization. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Um, there are a couple of awesome features that we are working on integrating into this um, new agent. Um, and Tommy and Brennan can maybe talk about um, those features. Uh, yeah, I can go first, I guess. So um, the biggest ones, um, from my perspective are uh we're adding support for getting um arbitrary uh custom labels in go programs so essentially uh, go has an api that um for pprof support lets you set uh whatever labels you want to whatever strings you want and then they show up in your um 
you know, if you use like that typical Go pprof tool, then they uh, show up in the profiles there. So we're adding support for that um, to our agent. And it should be in the uh, next release. Yeah, and the other thing we've been working on is developing uh, a unwinder for Lua, uh, specifically uh, Lua JIT. Um, we have kind of a prototype that works, um, and we're looking at uh, getting that into the new open telemetry based profiler um, and pretty soon. Um, if you're interested in that, you know, feel free to reach out. We'd love to have some more testers to bang on it and stuff. Um, but um, there's already kind of is that a base level somewhat useful uh, status and um, will hopefully in the near future kind of be released as a something for a wider usage. Super cool. Awesome. I think, Matthias, that's everything we have for today. Yeah, that's right. But it's a long list, um, and please go ahead and obviously try Parker version 22 or 022 and Parker agent 032, um, as well as obviously you can try it with uh, just Polar Seconds Cloud if you want to use the agent and try it locally but not set up everything. That also works. Um, and yeah, I think we, we have a bunch of things to follow up on, it seems like, uh, but that's fine. And we'll probably do a couple of patch releases here and there. Um, and I think we are far from done, as Tommy and Bren just uh, talked about. So yeah, I think we will be back with another Parker Office Hour in a month at latest, maybe in between for Asia and Pacific time zones. Um, and Hopefully we have more things to, to discuss and push up. Then I hope everybody has a wonderful week and enjoy your local time. Bye everyone. Take care. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye.